to begin by thanking uh, people that have made this uh, symposium possible. First, clearly the speakers that have been willing to come and share their time and energy with us, uh, preparing the talk and uh, sharing their thoughts and ideas today. So I, I'm sure this is going to be a, a very interesting day for us, and uh, I'd like to thank them. Uh, I'd like to recognize our uh, coordinating committee uh, that's put the, the symposium together, uh, Massimo Lolini from the Romance Languages Department at the U of O, uh, Karen Eslin and John Russell uh, from the library. I think that shows that this has been very much a, an interdisciplinary effort uh, and cooperation, very collegial cooperation across the campus to do this. And that's uh, recognized also by the uh, support and financial support we've had from various uh, units on campus that we'd like to thank. Uh, the U of O College of Arts and Sciences through a program grant, uh, Department of Computer and Information Science, Romance Languages Department, Department of Comparative Literature, and the Oregon Humanities Center, and also the U of O Libraries have all contributed toward making this possible, including the library giving us the space for this event. So again, very much cooperation across campus and uh, reflecting uh, the interest of the university in this type of uh, scholarship. And again, thank you also for everyone that's attending to uh, you know, give us more thought, power, and interaction as we move forward through the day. So ready to kind of turn to the symposium and uh, say that today our theme is the investigation of the impacts of digital and computing technology on our notions of text, how we go about writing text, our notions of authorship, how we go about reading text and understanding texts and studying texts. What's that doing to us in terms of how we see actually what text is and how that's been changing? Uh, in particular, we've asked our speakers as they present their respective projects to consider and address the following questions. How have the digital technologies you've worked with uh, served to facilitate your research? How have these technologies maybe gotten in the way of doing your research, constrained or limited that research? How the text developed in your work differ from traditional textual forms? So what is different about the text that you're generating through the use of this technology? How does your project enhance a reader's ability to understand and uh, interpret the text and appreciate those texts? And finally, how has the research uh, involving the digital technology actually changed your understanding of text and textualities and, and where you think you're going with that? So. Uh, that, that's the theme and, and the kind of questions that we've asked our speakers to address. So our first speaker today will be Massimo Lolini, professor of Romance Languages at the University of Oregon. He's written widely on 17th and 18th century literature. His first book was on Gian Battista Vico and the Renaissance and Baroque Poetics. And his second book, Il Vuoto della Forma Scrittura, Testimonianza e Verità, uh, includes essays on Dante, Petrarch, and Primo. He is principal investigator of the Oregon Petrarch Open Book Project, and that's what he will talk with us about today. Massimo. Okay, thank you, Art. Um, yeah, during my presentation, I'm going to present uh, two um, projects that are being developed at the University of Oregon. Uh, the first one is the Oregon Petrarch uh, Open Book, uh, uh, which is a uh, working uh, database driven item text uh, in and around uh, Francis Petrarch's Glenu Bulgarian Fragmenta, also known as uh, the Cantoniere. <coughs> the original uh, Latin uh, title given by Petrarch to his uh, collection of poems literally translates uh, fragments of uh, scattered scenes in vernacular. Uh, it conveys uh, the idea of an ongoing project. Uh, that in taking a unitary shape and form maintains uh, a fragmentary, uncertain, and open uh, nature. This title is uh, still the most accurate to describe uh, uh, Petra's lifelong project. He started writing uh, the first poems around 1327 and kept writing them for more than 40 years. And the transcription and the ordering of the sequence itself went on until 1374, uh, which is uh, 1374, uh, which is the year of the poet himself. The second project is uh, uh, Humanist uh, Studies and the Digital Age. It's a peer-reviewed e-journal 
devoted to the repopulation of the seed, theological and philosophical ideas of writing and reading literary text, uh, motivated by the advent of the digital technology and of electronic uh, text. The two projects are uh, connected, uh, the journal uh, Medicine and uh, the critical and theoretical side of the OPOB and grew out of that experience. Uh, let's begin with the uh, OPOB, uh, which is really the main focus of my <coughs> presentation. Using open source uh, software, we are building a flexible and comprehensive structure of digital assets that promotes innovative research, preservation, <coughs> and pedagogy based on uh, international collaboration among scholars and institutions. In the current iteration, the, uh, OP, uh, in the current iteration of the OPOB, a scholar is able to read a poem in the original language, examine uh, commentaries, and compare a series of uh, different translations, analyze um, contemporary writing, and finally explore multimedia assets associated with the poem. The RVF menu uh, that you may see on the screen allows users to read Petra Trevo Vulgarium Fragmenta in different forms, media and formats by clicking on the link uh, on, on the links on the left side of the page. The link critical edition uh, includes both the most recent critical edition of the Canzoniere, prepared in 2008 uh, by Giuseppe Savoca, and the previous uh, critical edition uh, prepared in 1964 by Gianfranco Contini. This uh, is the printed uh, version of Savoca critical edition along with the expository volume that accompanies it. This edition is very different from uh, all previous editions of the Canzoniere and arguably the most innovative in its editorial decision, triggered by the use of digital technology and ultraviolet uh, analysis. Many innovations are related to punctuation. For instance, uh, <coughs> the interpretation of Sonnet 179 changes in the new edition because of a comma at the end of verse 6. Preparation of the edition involved approaching the canzoniere with a view to establishing concordances, correlations among all aspects of its lexicon, including lexical, graphemic, and visual elements. Uh, Savoca holds uh, that the use of computer technology, both on the lexical level and in the treatment of images, made the difference with respect to the traditional philological approach both in analysis and in uh, the properly editorial phase. Proceeding by concordance correlations implies that before making any editorial decision, one must compare all analogous elements of the work while being aware of the received philological tradition. Savaka is convinced that today only computer science can provide a scientific basis for our textual analysis. Digital treatment of a text, he writes, allows us to move from the syntagm to the paradigm, that is, puts us in contact with the system specific to the text that we wish to understand and also publish. The OPOB uh, decided to include Savoca's critical edition as the actual base text of the digital project while being aware that the philology of a test is a continuously open technical and cognitive process, and that as a consequence, the hermeneutic task of the interpreter is inexhaustible uh, and should always be philologically oriented. The emergence of a distinct uh, humanist philology did not start for sure with digital technology and actually is principally linked to the inception of book technology in the 13th century. Since its origin, humanism uh, had its focal point in the awareness of the historical and material contingency of text and human experience of time. 
to the point that, as Ronald Witt uh, uh, writes, even postmodern scholars who want to abandon the rigidly conceived uh, Enlightenment and Renaissance paradigm are carrying forward a radical, in a radical way a project that began anew with the humanist, being skeptical about texts. Philology is the master key of the OPOB, a project that uh, takes one step forward computer assistant reconstruction of the text envisioned by Savota towards the creation of an hypertext that would document the historical evolution of the canzoniere from manuscript culture to print and digital culture. In this perspective, all the editions of the canzoniere previous to Savotkas maintain their value and utility as a witness to the multiple lives of the text and its reception and translation. For this reason, we decided to keep in our hypertext the previous critical edition prepared by Contini. Thus, in the OPOB, it is possible to switch from one edition to the other using the, uh, this, the drop-down menu that uh, you can see in the slides. Um, the hypertext includes not only critical editions, but also diplomatic editions of Petrar Canzoniere. And this is an important innovation uh, introduced by digital philology, as opposed to traditional philology, that considers critical edition and diplomatic edition as incompatible. Uh, the link uh, diplomatic editions include, uh, at the moment, only the 1904 uh, edition prepared by Ettore Modigliani. Uh, this is uh, the literal transcription of the latest version of the Rerum Bulgarian Fragmenta conceived by Petrar in the Codex Vatican Latin 31-95. This edition is still interesting, not only because it was the main source for continuing critical edition, but also because it maintains the horizontal formats of the poem followed by Petrar and his scribe Giovanni Malpaghini. The link manuscript will soon include the Codex Quirignano D221. This manuscript is one of the least studied in the early Petrarchan documents of the Rerum Bulgarian Fragmenta and one of the most revealing. It is a fair copy in an accurate end that follows the uh, graphological matrices inherent in Petrarch's own manuscripts. The sonnets are copied two verses per line across the page in a two-column format, as are canzoni, ballate, and madrigals. The link uh, in Cunabula will soon include the Editio Princep, the earliest printed uh, edition of the canzoniere published in Venice in 1470 by Windelin de Spira, now in the Querignana Library in, in Brescia. While most copies of, of this first edition are known for their uh, uniquely sparse uh, visual presentation without commentary or other paratextual features, the Querignana copy uh, of the Edition Princip is famous for its extensive illustration that serve as a elaborate glosses of fundamental natural motifs in the poems. Thanks to the generosity of the Quirignana Library in Brescia, Italy, these important assets are now part of the University of Oregon Night Library repository, uh, digital repository associated to the OPOB. And thanks to an ECLS uh, Digital Innovation Fellowship, uh, this year we plan to transcribe and, um, these the new assets with the text encoding uh, initiative using the uh, TPEN uh, software and then visualize them within the OPOB. The uh, library repository associated to the OPOB has uh, the images described through XML documents and can provide them on demand uh, over HTTP uh, that uh, our website can view on a per user basis. All the above uh, mentioned assets of the library repositories are now uh, linked to the OPOB and at the same time have been made available for anyone to access and use for research. 
Uh, the uh, apparatus menu of our sites allows users to consult different assets of the site from pedagogical apparatuses, such as paraphrases, summaries of individual poems, to specific audiovisual archives from contemporary writings and tweets to historical commentaries to individual poems. The translations are a fundamental part of the hypertext that presently includes two Renaissance translations in Spanish and uh, in French by uh, Enrique Garcés and Vasquez Filleu, respectively, an English translation and part partial translations in Russian, Chinese, Japanese, and German. The link commentaries uh, include uh, at the moment, only Velutello's Le Volgari Opere del Petrarca, which is a very important uh, um, commentary for the reception of the canzoniere <coughs> during the Renaissance in Europe. In the near future, we plan to include uh, in this section all the major uh, modern and uh, early modern and modern commentaries of the canzoniere. The link uh, rewritings include, at the moment, only a few uh, examples of Renaissance and Baroque rewritings of patriot poems, such as Francisco de Quevedo and Luis de Gongora rewriting of Petrarch's Canzone 323. We started to include also a section of contemporary rewriting, and in the near future, we plan to expand significantly this section to document the afterlife and reception of Peter Canzonieri in modern and contemporary literature. The OPOB encourages an active and polyphonic reading by providing different platforms of critical attention, using movable boxes that allow selecting and combining the different assets of the RVF and apparatus menus. This is possible to the link compare poems and assets in the upper right of the screen. Uh, the user may compare multiple versions of the original text in Italian, for example, uh, the Modigliani Diplomatic Edition and the recent critical edition prepared by uh, Savo. The user may choose uh, one of the texts of the RVF and then add elements of the apparatus to compare different translations. Um, or read one poem of the canzoniere, consulting at the same time paraphrases, uh, summaries, and tweets. Or commentaries, such as Velutello. Also, the user may read uh, one poem while consulting the archives, visual, audio, an essay related to that specific poem. In the project menu, the user may find the list of scholars participating to the advisory boards, the credits recognizing the work of the various collaborators and the project staff, including the web designers who created the site. Finally, the submission menu uh, allows uh, you, uh, scholars and, and students to uh, enter new content in the OPOB the list of uh, links uh, that you see on the screen refers uh, to submission forms that are linked to the base text of the RVF. We are currently implementing uh, an experiment in uh, uh, crowdsourcing, uh, inviting our registered users to provide translations of the 366 Italian tweets of the canzoniere in English. The submission will be moderated by a group of scholars that are part of the editorial board of the site. The home page of the OPOB links directly to the e-journal Humanist Studies and the Digital Age. This is a peer-reviewed journal, e-journal, that grew out of the experience of the OPOB. <coughs> the journal encourages new theoretical engagements based on comparative media studies translations and interdisciplinary approaches to new humanist philologies and philosophies made, uh, made possible by digital technology. Writing and reading are surely still at the core of the humanist enterprise, but in the new technological and social context, they are not enough. 
the advent of digital technology requires a new cultural awareness, a new literacy that, as Edward uh, Reingold puts it in his recent Net Smart, would teach us to master the process and development of knowledge and to use intelligently and humanely the internet. From this need comes our choice of thoroughly studying the new practices of textuality and their impact on the idea of humanism and the translatio studi, the transferring our cultural legacy from earlier forms into digital technology that we are experiencing in our time. The first issue of the journal was devoted to the study of the evolution of Francis Petrarch, Revo Bulgari Fragmento, from manuscript culture to print and digital culture. It included important theoretical contributions from some major scholars in, in Petrarch studies, and in the section project, we published the first outcomes of a research project <coughs> developed by a group of scholars from di different uh, institutions. They plan to um, help constructing the hypertext uh, configuration of the POB by attempting a collective research on the fortune of a single poem of the Rerum Vulgarum Fragmenta, Sonnet 35, Solo et Pensoso i Più Deserti Campi. As I'm moving toward, toward uh, my conclusion, I will now draw some uh, theoretical remarks uh, having in mind the, the questions uh, that are at the core of our symposium. Um, let uh, me remind the first group of questions that Art already <coughs> mentioned. How have uh, available digital technologies facilitated new approaches to your research? Uh, do the text presented in your work vary from traditional textual forms? In what way? How has your uh, work changed your understanding of text and textualities? Uh, how does your project enhance a reader's ability to understand and appreciate the text you present? In my presentation, I have pointed uh, to two main areas of innovation. One, philological, describing how the base text of the OPOB prepared by Savoca was created through computer-assisted philology. The other area of innovation is related to the idea of hypertext that we are implementing, allowing the user to follow the genesis and evolution of Petrarch collection and compare different versions and as conceived by the author or, uh, or as presented and published in different incarnations from manuscript to printed editions. Moreover, in the hypertext, uh, poetic rewritings uh, and translations become an important realization of Petrarch's work and significant interpretation of his poetry in dialogue with other artistic forms, literary or not. As a result, then, uh, this uh, apparatus of metatexts that constitute the corpus of the hypertext around Petrarch Rerum uh, Vulgarum Fragmenta requires an active reading. Uh, based on critical and philological engagement with the text and its reception. The last set of questions I address in my conclusion is the following. How have available digital technologies restrained or limited your research? More specifically, how is the textual encoding initiative changing the way we visualize and read text? I am tempted to answer this question by saying that digital technology did not restrain or limit my research, and that actually it helped me in taking critical advantage of previous technology through a process of remediation of the text we inherited from the past. However, in my uh, presentation, I have emphasized the humanist root of modern philology that came to life along with the technology of, of the book. Those roots, in my view, are not overcome by the digital revolution as it has been theorized, for example, by uh, John Bryant's idea of a fluid text, uh, which is very much discussed in current debates on digital humanities. Bryant follows Derrida's disregard for nostalgia for origins 
and of the idea of a truth free from free play. In other words, Bryant and Derrida suggest that the free play of the fluid text leads to a transcendence beyond man and humanism and point out uh, the need of new ways of reading, interpreting, and teaching, favoring a mode of interpretation that decenters meaning and is happy with given and existing fragments of signification. The OP OB uh, takes into consideration the basic uh, fluidity of text as the first step of digital philology. However, we do not emphasize the free play of fragments of signification, but hypertextual construction of meaning, the hermeneutical value of text through editing, marking up, drawing on phenomenological comparative and hermeneutic procedures. The OPOB aims at developing a divinatory and creative idea of crit criticism, intrinsically hermeneutic and based on relational rather than ontological notion of meaning. This is a humanist idea, hermeneutical, perspectical, and finite. As I move toward, uh, as we move toward the encoding of manuscripts and early books written more than six centuries ago, we are aware that on the one hand, the computational notion of texts as a type of data does not coincide with the notion of text as a product of literary activity. And we know that on the other hand, encoding of text and markup language belong not to the world of formalism, but to the world of representation. In other words, we know that markup is not a data model, but a type of data representation, partial and limited as any type of representation and interpretation. However, besides constraining us within their intrinsic limits, digital te uh, philology and textual encoding initiatives provide us with a challenging and stimulating opportunity to reread and reinterpret the masterpieces of the past from the point of view of a new technology and the new questions that we are facing. In our view, the new, the new digital philology is like uh, Benjamin Angel of history, the angel that he saw represented in Paul Clay's painting, Angelus Novus, an angel looking through, uh, looking, looking though as he's about to move away from something, uh, he's still uh, melancholically contemplating. Hypertext theory associated with the paradigm of translations brings to the center of the philological task the question of the diversity of languages and calls for a continuous process of retranslation of the great works of world literature, a process attentive to the intertextuality and intersemiotic transposition <coughs> triggered by these masterpieces, a process in which the reader is becoming involved on a global level. This may trigger a uh, hospitality of languages, uh, much needed in our time, one in which the different languages nurture each other without collapsing into a neutral and aseptic meta-language driven by political and technological forces. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Massimo. We decided that we would take uh, questions after two of the presentations, so for each of the hours there. So, uh, Abigail will come up here. Sure, so Abigail, our next speaker will be Abigail Fiery. She's an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Kentucky. She's specializing in early medieval Europe, legal history, and manuscript studies. Her research focus has been on the Carolingian times, with insights published in a recent book, The Contrite Heart. Prosecution and Redemption in the Carolingian Empire. She has coordinated a digital humanities project entitled the Carolingian Canon Law Project. And she'll talk with us about that today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a real honor and also a genuine pleasure to be here. So thank you to the organizers and everyone else. Um, <clears throat> it is perhaps becoming a commonplace 
that we are in the midst of a revolution in communicative technology that as we move from print culture to digital culture, in some respects, parallels the transition made nearly 600 years ago from manuscript cultures to print culture. I come to you as one who is acculturated, as it were, not only to the print world, but also to the world of handwritten medieval manuscripts. And just as the digital revolution has the many social, economic, political, and intellectual transformations that the printing press effected, so does it also weirdly reverse some of the features of print and resituate us in an older way of thinking about texts and the methods at our disposal for working with them. In many ways, we are recreating the medieval experience of the text. We are making private copies of texts that may be fluid, altered, incorrect, borrowed, compiled as mashups, reorganized, glossed, corrected, and passed on to other copyists. In medieval manuscripts, texts were not fixed, static, or standardized as they are in print. Yet we also inherit the presumptions of print culture for wide dissemination and mass production, a large and literate audience, and a conviction that individual creativity, freedom of speech, and a democratic environment govern the internet, just as they governed print culture in the modern West. It may be useful to consider the adventures of Alice in Wonderland as we puzzle over digital textualities. We know from Alice that Wonderland does not quite correspond to the world as we know it. The rules don't quite work. Well-known poems cannot be uttered without unexpected transformations that are sometimes baffling, even nonsensical, and that in themselves become the subjects of new confusing debates. You'll remember that Alice starts out trying to recite the poetry um, that she's been drilled to memorize um, in, in the schoolroom, and suddenly it, it turns into um, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Bat, or, or whatever. Um, so rather, however, than lead us into confusing debates, I hope to use the fairly simple, even mundane history of the Carolingian Canon Law Project, the CCL, to show how one project responded to problems in textualities, those represented in medieval manuscripts, those represented in the digital wonderland, and the sometimes surprising relationships between them. So let me begin with a brief overview of the CCL. Compared to many projects, it is not glamorous. And that in itself merits consideration. Almost every digital humanities project has an exposed character simply by virtue of being on the internet rather than disseminated through established publishers who guide works as appropriate toward either more scholarly or more popular audiences. Scholars with digital projects are suddenly acting as public historians, public literary critics, public intellectuals, or public curators. This is a bit of a challenge for a site dedicated to the investigation of ninth century canon law. Although as part of our public service, the CCL project publishes translations, commentary, and bibliography, the real orientation of the CCL is toward the specialist research community. What makes the project interesting, I think, is that we are attempting to tackle some complex problems in textual studies by building a digital environment for scholarly investigation of hitherto unpublished and essentially unknown materials. Because the problems we are tackling are peculiarly medieval and often not encountered or even familiar to scholars in other areas of the humanities, I shall speedily review them. The challenges fall into three categories. We are working with an enormous corpus, mastery of which is beyond the capabilities of a single researcher. 
The material is essentially available only in medieval manuscripts because no one has been able to figure out how to edit it for print <coughs> presentation. It is in Latin, so there are linguistic considerations in building software. To address the problem of the enormous unknown corpus, we built the CCL to support ongoing collaborative research. Digital projects tend to be large in one way or another, and it is often the size and scope that shape digital research that could not be undertaken so well or efficiently in print cultures. In this respect, we seem to be entering a renewed phase of great historical enterprises, such as those of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries described by Dom David Knowles. It is edifying to reread his accounts of the Bolandists, the Maurists, and the Monumenta Germania Historica. Of the Bolandists, who gave us access to the vast hagiographical corpus, Knowles wrote, I quote, Theirs was the first great enterprise of cooperative scholarship in the modern world. And theirs is the only enterprise of the 17th century which still continues in active function. It remains a small, unofficial group of Jesuits living together in a single establishment for years, or for life, devoted solely to the collection and publication of the original sources for the lives of the saints. Fortunately, as a second generation Bolandist was to remark, neither Boland nor Father Provincial had the faintest idea of what they had undertaken to do. As a modern Bolandist has put it, they crossed the Rubicon without noticing it was there. <laughs> Knowles goes on to identify the unexpected volume of the work and the need for funding as critical issues to be addressed by these scholarly pioneers, as well as the difficulties in structuring the task and form of publication. After a two-year tour of European libraries, during which they hired copyists everywhere, they had collected 1,400 lives of saints. Their unwritten constitution for the project was, to quote Knowles, to labor completely, in common, regulated by free discussion, with decisions taken together according to the traditional customs of the house, with no leader or superior, but the senior in years, for the time being, acting as primus inter pares. The actual workshop came to be the library. So I think what intrigues me is the thought that these great enterprises, which before could only be sustained by religious orders um, that would endure for centuries and had dedicated labor and expertise, can now be taken, undertaken by single individuals or small teams in the digital environment. So back to the CCL. To address the problem of access to the texts and support for editorial experimentation, we decided to build an environment for publishing transcriptions of as many manuscripts as we can muster, and also to provide digital tools for investigation and manipulation of the transcriptions. There is little reason to publish manuscript images on the CCL. That is, after all, nearly the publication of the rawest data. There are also, of course, issues with copyright on the images. The third challenge facing the CCL has been that we had to teach the software Latin. And to increase the difficulties, Latin that does not have standard orthography, what medievalists call wild Latin. Before we could build the research environment, the publishing environment, and the digital tools, we needed to figure out how to represent the evidence of the manuscripts in digital format. We are building for scholars accustomed to print, but we also want to take advantage of the dynamism of the digital medium. We knew that for the purposes of software applications, we would need to encode the text in XML. We knew that the emerging international standard for such textual work is the TEI, the Textual Encoding Initiative, P5. The strengths of TEI are that it is an international standard 
with an active community for development, support, and arbitration of standards, and that it can be used for very detailed or granular analysis of textual structures, as well as of paleographic evidence. In TEI, one can mark the subdivisions of a text, that is, chapters, paragraphs, quotations, subtitles, etc. And on the paleographic side, one can mark when there is a change of hand in a manuscript, or damage to the manuscript, or an image, or illumination on the page, and so forth. So when we ponder digital textualities, we should perhaps contemplate the return to structuralism, or as Massimo indicated, formalism, that TEI encourages for both good and ill. TEI presumes that textual structure can be described with a rigid hierarchical system of markup. <coughs> Lots of markup. At the end of the first year, we realized that we would be drowning in markup and that the labor required to encode every transcription could not be supported and we were doomed. <laughs> Before we arrived at that conclusion, however, we built the Latin speaking search engine that can operate fairly well when there is no standard orthography and when the person searching cannot anticipate the form of the words. We wanted to avoid cumbersome Boolean searching, which does require that you can anticipate where to put the asterisk or um, the operator. So we worked on fuzzy searching, the now familiar Google suggestions, um, did you mean? Um, and this is, I think, another instance of changing textuality in a digital environment. You will recall that in Wonderland, Alice is invited to a croquet game where she discovers that the mallets are flamingos and the balls are hedgehogs. It makes for a game that depends less on rules and the player's skills than on the unexpected dynamism of a game played with moving living components. The flamingo may suddenly move as one is preparing to whack a ball with it, and the ball may suddenly uncurl and run away. Whether or not one enjoys such a game is another question. In developing, <laughs> in developing the search engine, we started to take advantage of our TEI P5 markup to move away from print conventions and to restore some of the formal features of medieval manuscripts. In particular, we developed means of displaying both corrected and uncorrected readings when the medieval scribe made corrections with toggling. This is a screenshot of the first um, interface one encounters when using the search engine. And um, you can see that on the one hand, this is where it's speaking ordinary Latin. If you search facultas, it'll pick up all of the ordinary um, forms of the noun. And then you get the Google, as it were, the fuzzy search for the wild Latin that the scribe may have written there that you might want to look um, at. Maybe he didn't write facultas, maybe he wrote occultas, etc. cetera. Um, the um, corrected and uncorrected <coughs> readings, um, when medieval scribes realize they've made a mistake, they may well make a correction in the manuscript, um, and we feel it's important to represent that. So what we've done is present the uncorrected reading in an elegant dark burgundy, and then when you click on that link, it goes to the corrected reading in red, and you can toggle correction by correction, so you can set up a text that's a mixture of corrected and uncorrected readings as seems appropriate in case you want to compare it to another copy of the text that may have caught some of those corrections, but not all of them. So you can start to check the relationships between manuscripts by looking at the relationships of corrected and uncorrected readings. Um, we also developed a couple of means of showing biblical citations. You can mouse over the text and the modern Vulgate reference will um, pop up um, if you want it. Um, and we restored the proper relationship, we're still working on this, of text and gloss. Medieval manuscripts do not have numbered footnotes or endnotes, 
glosses are in a purely spatial relationship to the relevant words, that is, the lemma in the main text. So in our uh, software, mousing over the main text picks up um, and highlights the cross-references to the glosses. And similarly, if you mouse over the glosses, it will help you locate the lemma in the text. Once the text was searchable and the corpus growing, we moved towards the addition of another digital tool to aid investigation, the collation software. We partnered with Juxta, which was developed initially for collation of 19th century English poetry. So we taught it Latin. We taught it how to display corrected and uncorrected readings. We taught it how to display glosses. And we opened out the beta release of web service Juxta in the CCL two weeks ago. I think we're now the first project to host the web service. Um, it doesn't yet have all of the features that we developed for the standalone version, so Juxta is supporting both the standalone and the web service for some of these um, special markup issues. Um, the light is so bright that this may be a little faint for you, but what Juxta does is provide highlighting in green of all the differences between different versions of the text, different transcriptions. Um, and then as you mouse over them, it shows you the corresponding difference. So if you mouse over Memoratus there, you'll see that in another manuscript it was written as Moratus and vice versa. The, um, and the lines in the center are for the alignment. You can scroll either side independently. Um, and the lines keep the similar portions of the text uh, aligned so that you can navigate through the collation. Um, as I say, this is another view, what's called the heat map <laughs> view. And again, yeah, you can see it. Um, the intensity of the blue and the number of disks over show the degree of difference between the witnesses. So I've got four witnesses here, and you can see that the Collectio San Blasiana is starting to go out as a bit of a renegade in terms of degree of, dis um, of difference. You can change the base text just by clicking on another witness, and it automatically recollates to that new base text. So you can really play around with the relationships of the manuscripts <coughs> and make editorial decisions about your selection of the base text. Um, and in this screenshot, I'm simply showing that again, um, the gloss and lemma are also available um, in the display. In the heat map view, um, if you click on any of the highlighted terms, it shows you then the variant readings in the other manuscripts. So side by side, you can compare two witnesses that you want to examine very closely. In the heat map view, you can um, compare all of your witnesses to the text. With respect to texturalities, the materials in the CCL offer perhaps rather unusual opportunities for digital manipulation. Um, the corpus of medieval canon law is problematic um, in that it doesn't seem to respond well to traditional Lachmanian analysis. Um, for many of these texts, there is essentially no Ur text. Um, instead, what we're dealing with are fluid texts in which any transcription may have been affected by contact with another transcription, another kind of text. So they're always sort of changing, mutating, evolving. Um, and among the reasons that these texts have defied standard methods of editorial analysis is that they are fluid compilations of statutes or canons drawn from a wide range of materials transmitted in other fluid compilations. Both the selection of the statutes and their order and often their identification and rubrics distilling their meaning change. 
Each manuscript copy of a text is unique, but the elements of most texts are transmitted in multiple copies, albeit in perhaps different textual configurations and different textual contexts. There is thus a conceptual corpus of several thousand canons from which Carolingian scholars of canon law might draw as they compiled their texts. Scholars, therefore, this is where I make my loose canons joke. Okay. Um, scholars, therefore, need to be able to view each text or compilation or collection as a whole to construe its intertextual aspects and scholars also need to be able to view each element in conjunction with its representations in other manuscripts. So for the CCL, recognizing that each canon is a discrete unit that has its own textual tradition and transmission, the challenge was to disaggregate the compilation, those medieval collections of canon law, while also conserving the full textual context of each canon in different collections and in different manuscripts. We want researchers to be able to study the relationships of different copies of particular canons, the frequency with which particular canons were copied, the breadth of their dissemination, their association with other canons, and so forth. We also knew it would be easier to build up our corpus of translations and annotations if we organized the project around individual canons as well as the compilations in which they circulate. So we built the matrix, which is a digital expression of a theory or argument that we can compile a conceptual corpus of the canon law that was known to Carolingian readers by assembling all the witnesses and then making it manipulable. So you can go to those filters and start putting in keywords and the matrix magically reorganizes itself so that you can search across several thousand canons of this ever-expanding corpus and find the individual canons that you want um, and their siblings, as it were, in other um, manuscripts. And we, that's also where we are putting the annotations and translations for each individual canon and because we are so intensely collaborative and like Massimo, encouraging crowdsourcing, um, if there is no translation yet, there's a cheerful little link that says, be the first to translate this canon, and you just click on it. <laughs> Allow me to encourage all of you to contribute translations and annotations. So with the matrix, you can sort, rearrange, and investigate every canon in our database. And you will also always know exactly in which manuscript the canon is found. The shelf marks of the manuscript are and the foliation are in the locus and shelf mark columns. We also started to develop other layers of scholarly information, bibliography, manuscript descriptions, information about the transcriptions, articles, a discussion forum for threading notes and queries from the community of users, and comment boxes for each translation and annotation so that users could correct information that's contributed and make suggestions and additions. So it's sort of a first stage of online peer review. In other words, we started to try to shift the project away from the immediate team of creators to the larger community of scholars and students as agents for building the content and usefulness of the site. But despite these accomplishments, there remained the problem of the burdens of encoding and proofreading. And it is a digital tool that seems to offer a solution. By the end of the first year, we knew that we wanted some means of auto-encoding our transcriptions. And in the second year, most fortuitously, Professor James Ginther of the Center for Digital Theology at St. Louis University approached us for partnership with his team to develop a transcription tool for images of handwritten documents, which we named TPEN, Transcription and Paleographic and Editorial Notation. 
Um, Jim's going to talk about T-Pen this afternoon, so I'm not going to talk about it now. You'll have to come back this afternoon. <laughs> we added to the transcription aids in T-Pen the capability to insert XML tags with buttons that are displayed immediately below the transcription box. And these buttons can be given human names so that the transcriber does not have to know any XML or TEI. He or she just marks the text using the standard scholarly terminology that is familiar. That's a gloss. That's a rubric. That's a canon. And I think that with that autoencoding and the little script we wrote to um, complete the markup um, because of the hierarchical considerations, my hope is that we'll be able to automate 80% of the markup, which means that we'll be able to publish transcriptions quite quickly um, and reduce our labor force. In TPEN, a CCL participant can designate a TPEN transcription as destined for the CCL, and at that point, the user's TPEN project is populated with the CCL customized TEI button set. And when the transcription is ready, it can be submitted directly to the CCL with the click of a button. Again, I encourage you all to, um, to join us. In sum, with TPEN, the search engine, and Juxta, contributors can efficiently transcribe manuscript materials, easily provide basic encoding, send the files to the CCL for rapid publication, at which point the content becomes searchable and can also be collated with other transcriptions. And you never know what you might end up with. Thank you very much. Yeah, very nice, two very nice presentations. We have time for a couple of questions or comments with, uh, with respect to those. Yes, any questions for Massimo or Adia? do explain the situation here. Um, scroll down for a second. The old presumption was that you could edit canon law text in the same way that you edited classical text. That is, you collate all the witnesses. I'm going to abandon this. I can't walk and chew gum at the same time, and I can't talk and do digital technology at the same time. Um, but the, the notion was that you collated all the witnesses and then through the scientific process of Lachmannian or genetic analysis um, established the text that you think the author produced, the single word text that then is copied. So, you know, essentially you're comparing what you think are the corruptions in the text, which are the genetic markers. Um, and the problem, particularly with law, I think, um, is that the texts also get corrected and you can't trace corrections back because, of course, corrections are correct. So you lose your genetic markers. Um, and that's one reason that it hasn't been possible to edit these texts. The comparison of the witnesses just doesn't make sense because you've got such combinations of Corruptions, corruptions of corruptions, corrections, corruptions of corrections, corrections of corruptions of corrections. <laughs> and so you, you can't form the, the um, tree of ancestry. So you have to think of a different editorial mode. Um, 
which I think many of the literary scholars are also doing when they think about these living texts where it's more clusters of relatives rather than descent from a single ancestor. So I think we are really starting to think about them in different ways. And the challenge for me with the CCL was to try and figure out how to um, be ethical about it and to make it as agnostic as possible so that scholars who are still very committed to Lachmanian analysis can use our software, can use our transcriptions and see if it works, but that editors who want to investigate other means of analyzing the text can also start to play and think of different ways of organizing the text. Does that answer your question? Are you beginning to have <coughs> pure users um, that are doing their research using? Um, it's interesting. There seems to be a generational divide, and we're seeing more graduate students who are, are willing to engage with it. Um, yeah, and I must say, we've been very, very quiet about um, its release. The, the big notice to the canon law community hasn't been published yet because I wanted Juxta to be a bit more stable before we invited everyone in. So I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. consider a, a paper uh, text that I represented, we uh, should take into consideration for sure that uh, he uh, brought uh, uh, two manuscripts. And uh, so the, the main source for this text uh, should be Petra himself. Uh, and uh, um, that's why I think that uh, um, the, the, the question of the original manuscript is still there in, in, in terms of, uh, of uh, importance of, of Petra's work, but uh, there are 1,000 manuscripts after Petra. The critical edition that I presented, the one from the 1964, was based uh, on uh, a diplomatic transcription of Petra's manuscript. So there was no relation with other texts. <coughs> it was, uh, uh, we consider that a critical edition, but in fact, was not because there was no relation with the other texts that were produced in, um, by a copyist of, of Petra's manuscript. The second critical edition I, I produced is re establishes a, a direct connection with Petra's own text. Uh, so Sauke went back to the original manuscript, forgetting uh, the diplomatic edition, showing how the diplomatic edition had mistakes, and then he considers four weaknesses of this edition and collates all the elements of, of that uh, of those four uh, weaknesses to create what he considers a critical edition of the text. Um, I think that. Uh, Digital technology offers us a way to um, contemplate uh, the pros and cons of, uh, of digital editing, and uh, I think that it's very important that we still consider the diplomatic editions. And I, I'm foreseeing that there, there are coming out new diplomatic editions of, of the Petra's manuscript, because 
and because uh, uh, philology is, uh, uh, is the philology of a text is never the first article. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, the manuscript of paper is not sure if it was perceived as a, a fair copy. Actually, it was perceived as a fair copy at the beginning, but then along the road, the uh, paper started uh, uh, to transform uh, this collection of poems, uh, not, in a, not in a fair copy conceived for the publication, uh, for distribution, but uh, he started considering this uh, manuscript as an archive or as poetry. So it was not, if even the original manuscript cannot be considered as the text. Uh, so I, I, I'm very much protected with uh, an idea of textuality that is uh, based on relationship among texts. Uh, and I, I appreciate very much what Abigail was, was saying, uh, uh, trying to uh, identify the different uh, roles that uh, the text uh, um, uh, undertakes. Uh, and I think that this te technology helps us a lot in that direction. And uh, I, I, I see that uh, there's an explosion of textuality that might be frightening, but on the other hand, uh, that's why we need a new literacy, that's why we need to understand how uh, reading literature in our times uh, entails uh, uh, a philological discussion of text and a digital philology discussion of text, because that's the direction we are going to, and we, uh, uh, the future generation will receive text from the past in the digital format and we need we need to to, um, to study the new textuality and, and the problems that they that we have. I would <coughs> endorse everything that Massimo said and also say that I think every text does have its own story. Um, and I guess what would trouble me is that if we end up in sort of the editorial wars with the Lachmanians brandishing their swords at the cluster analysts and vice versa. I think that we just need to be very broad-minded about the <coughs> possibilities in editorial theory and see which texts best support which approach. Is this the time or do we need the, to break for coffee? Well, I think we all need to break for coffee, but why not a quick question? <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll even need it more. I hope it's <laughs> I hope it's quick. Um, I, I love these two presentations, and they they, they brought out a lot of uh, questions in my mind that you weren't directly addressing, but that you really seeded and stimulated. And one of them is, uh, um, we are still teaching. Our teaching is still informed by a sort of intellectual proprietary model of academic propriety, <laughs> in, in, you know, intellectual property, academic propriety. But our students are coming be coming to us formed by a kind of a post intellectual. Technology makes it easy because contributors um, are registered CCL users. They have registered accounts, so anytime they post anything, um, we know who posted it. But they also get public credit on the website. Um, and what we're realizing is that in fact people are hesitating to contribute translations because they realize their names are going to be attached to them, and those translations had better be pretty good. So yes, we, we sort of work between the new collaborative crowdsourcing model and the older model of scholarly attribution. 
but you said the graduate students are more willing. <laughs> I mean, they're sort of, you know, they're that, they're that younger generation of new. Uh, you know, youth is brave. <laughs> Someone contributes uh, new content to the website, uh, this uh, contribution will be recognized by the technology itself. And besides that, when we do uh, crowd sourcing, as we are doing now, we, uh, we write the name of the, of the contributor. So each uh, translation <coughs> has uh, an attribution. Uh, so we, I know we, need, we still live in a, in a world of. And, and, and uh, we need to deal with that uh, every day. But uh, the fact that um, there are uh, plenty of texts that are uh, now available in the, in the free uh, domain, I, I, it's, it's wonderful. It's an unprecedented uh, occasion that we have to access these texts and to uh, um, have them circulate. Part of uh, projects. I think that uh, this is a, a wonderful opportunity uh, that is available now. <coughs> Great. Okay, well, I think we'll uh, take a 10 minute break and we'll have a lot of opportunity later this afternoon to have some more in depth discussions about these topics with our panel. So uh, I encourage everyone to take advantage of our refreshments. We'll take a 10 minute break.